Our expectations are self-fulfilling prophecies. What we expect will invariably determine what we will experience in the future. Bottom line is that our mind manifests what it expects strongly. Neuropsychologists who study expectancy theory say that we all spend our whole lives becoming conditioned to believe what happens next, either positively or negatively. This is because our brain expects an outcome and it unconsciously behaves in a manner to ultimately achieve that outcome. Therefore, it can be said that our expectations prime our behavior. If we expect positive outcomes, we are more likely to make choices that support those outcomes. For example, Suppose you've recently gone through a divorce, and even though the pain is real, you still expect to find happiness again in life. It is almost certain that you will find it because you will make choices that will help you move forward in the direction toward your expectations. It's the way we are psychologically wired. Therefore, a person's level of success is largely influenced by his optimistic nature that he holds in his mind for positive outcomes. Experts in human potential development advocate the power of optimism. Science has repeatedly proven that people who are optimistic are generally more successful, more lively and spirited, and have a better mental and physical health, all of which further support the quality of resilience. Now, psychologists define optimists as people who generally expect good things to happen in their lives. Pessimists, on the other hand, expect negative outcomes. The difference is in the nature of their expectation and the confidence they hold on their future and themselves. In a study involving 70,000 nurses, researchers found that higher optimism was associated with a lower risk of mortality from major causes of death, including cancer, heart disease, and strokes. In another study, people with a family history of heart disease who had a positive outlook in life were one-third less likely to have a heart attack than those who had a negative outlook. A study of cancer patients revealed that pessimistic patients under the age of 60 were more likely to die within eight months than non-pessimistic ones of the same initial health, status, and age. According to Dr. Martin Seligman, optimists have a completely different way of viewing success and failures as compared to pessimists. When an optimist experiences failure, he or she believes it's a temporary setback and a learning experience. In stark contrast, when a pessimist experiences failure, they assume that it is due to their lack of ability and begins to believe that it is a permanent situation they are stuck in. If they have to try again, they just know that they would fail again. So what's the point of trying? Some pessimists see failure as a certain outcome and they even stop trying. Such people act the symptoms of what is called learned helplessness. Learned helplessness is a psychological condition which affects both people and animals. It's a tendency to interpret a future event or expect it to happen in correspondence to a past experience or a past outcome. Some people develop a tendency of helplessness and powerlessness in areas where they have failed before. Now, Seligman demonstrated in his theory that people can be broken down by repeated experiences of failure to ultimately reach a point of extreme pessimism. What he also found was that optimism is something that can be learned if you learn to change your explanatory style and your belief in the future. He also discovered that optimists constantly talk about what things are rather than what they aren't, what is in front of them instead of what is not. The difference is that pessimistic people talk about what things are not. Dr. Seligman also claimed that the manner in which optimists and pessimists explain their failure is very different from each other. There are three basic differences in the reactions of optimists and pessimists. The first difference is that the optimist sees a setback as temporary, while the pessimist sees it as permanent. The optimist sees an unfortunate event, such as an order that falls through, or a sales call that fails as a temporary event, something that is limited in time and that has no real impact on the future. The pessimist, on the other hand, sees negative events as permanent, as part of life and destiny. The optimist makes a mistake and brushes it off. The pessimist makes a mistake 
and considers that he or she is not really good enough. He or she is not competent. He or she is not likable, popular, or successful, and becomes depressed, becomes uh, possessed by self-pity, sees themselves as a victim, and feels like quitting. The second difference between the optimist and the pessimist is that the optimist sees difficulties as specific, while the pessimist sees them as pervasive. This is really important. This means that when things go wrong for the optimist, he looks at the event as an isolated incident largely disconnected from other things that are going on in his life. He deals with it and gets busy and puts it behind him. For example, if something you were counting on failed to materialize and you interpret it to yourself, as being an unfortunate event, but something that happens in the course of life and business, you know, uh, stuff happens, you would be reacting like an optimist. The pessimist, on the other hand, is different. The pessimist sees disappointments as being pervasive. Ah, woe me. To him, setbacks are indications of a problem or shortcomings that pervades every area of his or her life. They have this what's the use attitude. The third difference between optimists and pessimists is that optimists see events as external, while pessimists interpret events as personal. When things go wrong, the optimist will tend to see the setback as resulting from external factors over which one has little control. For example, if the optimist is cut off in traffic, instead of getting angry or upset, he will simply downgrade the importance of the event by saying something like, oh well, I guess that person just having a bad day, or maybe he or she's on a, in a hurry to get to work, or something like that. The pessimist, on the other hand, has a tendency to take everything personally. If the pessimist is cut off in traffic, he or she will react as though the other driver has gotten up that smart morning and driven through traffic and deliberately acted to cut him off to make him upset and angry. The hallmark of the fully mature, fully functioning, self-actualizing personality is the ability to be objective and unemotional when caught up in the inevitable storms of daily life. Hence, it is clear that the kind of explanation style one undertakes, optimistic or pessimistic, influences our perception of the world and the way we react to stressful situations that we are going through. With an optimistic lens, we see various possibilities even in adverse conditions and thus we actively employ a wider range of problem-solving strategies that help us develop a calm sense of hope regarding the outcome. On the other hand, pessimism, like many other negative emotions, narrows down our focus and limits the options that could be available to us. Nobody is born with an explanatory style. We all gradually develop one. Nobody is a born pessimist. Children are optimists. Somehow, down the line, as we grow up with experiences, especially the bitter ones, our nature of optimism also changes. Moreover, optimism is a delicate subject to consider. Often, we misunderstand what exactly is optimism. There is short-term optimism and also exists a long-term optimism. There is realistic optimism and there is delusional optimism. The optimism that makes us resilient is realistic and long-term optimism. Let's call it real toe. Short-term versus long-term optimism. Hope is important because it can make the pleasant moment less difficult to bear. If we believe that tomorrow will be better, we can bear hardship today. Thick not Han. Optimism is a positive expectation about the future. But if we put a strict timeline on the future, the very nature of optimism is bound to change. To prove my point, let me first introduce to you the idea of what I call the short-term versus long-term optimism in the light of Stockdale Paradox. One of the early references of Stockdale Paradox came from the book Good to Great written by Jim Collins. Now, James Stockdale was a naval officer and a Vietnamese prisoner of war. He was held captive for over seven years and he was repeatedly tortured. He had no reason to believe that he would make it out alive, but he did, unlike many of his fellow inmates who died in prison. According to the narration given by Stockdale, many so-called optimists could not make it out of their prison alive. His fellow soldiers in captivity were actually counting their days in optimism, hoping that they will rejoin with their family sooner. 
The optimists said that they will get out by Christmas, but many Christmas dates came and went. Then they thought they would be out by the time of Thanksgiving, but many Thanksgiving dates came and passed. But all of them were still hoping that probably by Easter they could get out. But Easter came and went, they could not. Most of them who hoped optimistically with certain deadlines in mind were growing in despair and hopelessness as many deadlines kept passing by. Their health deteriorated and they died with broken hearts. But Stockdale wasn't a regular optimist like his fellow inmates. He was a long-term optimist. He knew that he would make it out alive. He was a long-term optimist, unlike many others who focused only on the short-term goals. Now, here's the difference between short-term optimism and long-term optimism. Short-term optimism is not grounded in reality. It is more like the Pollyanna wishful thinking. You can also call it the delusional optimism. But long-term optimism is grounded in the brutal reality, and yet it is anchored in the long-term success. It's a belief that no matter what the obstacles are, sooner or later, success will prevail in the end. No matter what happens now, the now is not permanent and everything has to change in the end. Victor J. Frankel, who is a Holocaust survivor, calls it tragic optimism. That means having an optimism in the face of adverse conditions. It is a paradoxical idea about acknowledging your current difficulties and tragedies and intermixing them with the positive belief that in the end, you will still triumph. The second gist of Stockdale paradox is that you need to balance realism with optimism. Most of us are short-term optimists and we lose hope when our desires and the expected outcome doesn't collide with the, our timelines we have previously set. It is true that hope is not a good strategy, but sometimes when you don't have anything else standing in your favor, all you have got is a hope or a belief that everything will be okay in the end. What short-term optimists fail to do is to confront the reality of their situation. They often stick their heads in the sand like the ostriches in a hope that the difficulties will pass by or will go away on its own. People who are resilient are okay with sitting in the negative, feeling real sadness and experiencing the gamut of emotions. Truly resilient people know that a huge part of the process is accepting the bad feelings that come with adversity and not trying to escape them. One shouldn't resort to finding escape gates from such situations because through them, you learn how to fight back. You grow from them because they help in building your strength. You realize that avoidance and fear are signs of weakness. Resilience is not about a falsely optimistic Pollyanna view of the world, but about being realistic with what happens, feeling intensely and not turning away from facing the struggle. Being realistically optimistic is different from being just Pollyanna optimistic, where you're just making promises that you can't keep. Admiral James Stocktail, in his book about the Vietnam War, actually had this great quote, You must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. What Stockdale was saying is that when they looked at people that came out of the war and had aftershocks from the stress that they had endured, the people to die in captivity soonest were the ones who said, we'll be free by Christmas or we'll be free by summer. Because once they set that expectation in their mind, they only had the reality of not hitting those milestones and that would cause depression and dejection. What Stockdale advocated is that you have realistic expectations and you're optimistic, but in a realistic way. Resilience is about engaging with life and involves being authentic with your experience to reach the other side. Rather than circling around it or wishing that it disappears on its own, it is an option that's common, apprehensible, and available to all of us. The first thing that we know about resilience is that resilient people are realists. And I'll give you a corporate example of that. Remember there was a first bombing of the World Trade Center years before the planes actually crashed into the towers. At that time, one company, which was Morgan Stanley, said, we better recognize we are in a very high value target and this is not likely the last attempt. 
sooner or later the terrorists will come again to destroy these towers and we have to be ready. That's what a realist does. No ducking of the head in the sand, no wishful thinking, just like, hey, we have to pay attention here. And what they did was to get a, a wonderful, resilient Vietnam vet as their head of security and do drills constantly so that their people, over 7,000 of them, knew how to evacuate from that tower. And then they also got three offices off-site so that were the towers to go down, they'd be able to continue their business. Well, what happened? Um, it was so sad. Uh, during, during the planes crashing into the towers on 9-11, is it paid off for them? Even though their floor took a direct hit, fortunately they were in the second tower so that they had some, some time. But the security got everybody out but seven people. The head of security actually perished because he was getting everybody else out. But it's extraordinary that they were able to evacuate virtually everybody from those offices. So we all have to be realists. If you're living in a lousy marriage, if you're living with an abusive person, you have to be realistic. It's unlikely that person is going to change. You're going to have to make a radical step toward your own freedom. Or if you've lost your job, it's not a good idea to sit around and do affirmations and expect a job to come to you. You need to get out there and be a realist and take charge. So realistic optimism is a really important concept and it's really useful, especially at a time like this. I'm going to break it down a little bit. So to begin with, thinking about the realistic part of it, being realistic is being able to take a look at our situation, where we are, what's happening, and really evaluating it and knowing what the truth is, what, what, what is the reality of the, of the world that we're living in right now. The other thing that's really useful for developing the optimism side of things is if we can look at past experiences that we've had that maybe were quite tricky or were a hard time or was an experience where we went through that was really tough, if we can look at that time and work out actually what were the things that worked, what were the things that helped, what were the things that got us through, what did we learn about ourselves and how did we grow as a person from that experience? So it's this idea that we can actually grow. We're not fixed. So realistically optimistic people think that they can actually make things happen for themselves. They also recognise that there will be challenges and there will be obstacles and that at times it will be really hard. And that is the reality of it. But if they stick with it and they go through those obstacles and they do the hard work, that actually there may be a positive outcome, an optimistic outcome at the end of it. This pandemic is a world-changing event. We are already experiencing its impacts in different arenas of our lives. Now getting back to normal without knowing the brutality of the situation can make people delusionally optimistic to a new reality which they are not prepared to handle well. Here's the thing, short-term optimism will kill your resilience. Therefore, it's time to really focus on the long overhaul and to re-strategize and bounce back from the failures and the declines you must be experiencing right now. It's important to cultivate the belief that no matter what happens, in the end, everything will be fine. We don't know when, but surely the difficult phase will pass. Nothing stays the same forever. I feel it's paramount to develop the quality of being patient for reaching the end. A resilient person looks at the long-term view. They take a long-term view. They step back and they see the long term. They are prepared for the long haul. Rome was not built in a day. And they know that their future, their future, is determined by their efforts today. So they do what they need to do today, but they also know that it's gonna take time. That's what a resilient person does. The reason we need to be a long-term and a realistic optimist is because we see many people becoming hopeless and helpless with the situation they are currently in. In these times of uncertainty caused by the pandemic during the quarantine, many people thought things would get back to normal in just a few weeks. 
and the outbreak will be over in just few months. But when they realize that it is something that is going to stay for a longer period of time than they expected, their dreams were crushed. Their sense of false short-term optimism did not allow them to prepare for the worst. Their hopes were unfulfilled. Potentially, their businesses will not be in a state to carry on because they had not prepared themselves even for the worst case scenario. Patience is long-term optimism in action. Of course, it's frustrating when things take longer than you expected. But if you give up because your progress is too slow, then you won't be able to make your dream come true at all. Does it really matter that it will take you longer? Don't get obsessed over deadlines. Certain things take longer and don't work within the time frame. The gestation period from seed to fruit varies based on the projects you have undertaken. Just because 100% of your goal is not accomplished on time, it does not mean that you have failed entirely. It means you're making progress and you just need some extra time to complete it. If you often fail because slow progress discourages you, focus on reaching the goal and not on reaching it within a made-up deadline. Deadlines should be rough estimates. They should not dictate your life. You see, resilience is about flexibility. Being too hard on yourself can eventually break you. So stay flexible. The driving force of realistic and long-term optimism is having a proper purpose for life. Nietzsche, in a famous phrase, said, Those who have something to live for are capable of standing almost any how. If you want to be driven with resilience, then develop a purpose in life. Have a reason to wake up to every single day. Have a strong, vivid vision of what you want to create. Indulge in exciting and engaging activities every day that take you one step closer to fulfilling your dreams. It's important to not just have a dream, we must live the dream as well. Whenever you do things that will take you closer to your fulfillment of goal, you are actually living your dream. Purpose gives your life a boost to go beyond temporary obstacles. It provides a clear and targeted direction to maintain course. Even when plans get sidetracked, purpose helps to refocus and continue on. That's at the heart of resilience. Imagine the tremendous amount of courage it takes for a seed to push itself through the earth. Imagine the amount of desire that is sleeping inside that seed that is its natural intelligence and that that desire is what wakes up inside of it and begins to, to break through that hard earth and, and begin to reach upward, right, towards the sun towards its natural evolution. And all of us have this kind of seed inside of us of what our purpose really is, what we truly desire to make with our life. And so, you know, when you feel that you are in pain or have come from pain, really think, what is the deepest desire of your life's purpose? What is the highest manifestation of of what you can do with this one incredibly short and beautiful lifetime. I always say our, our soul has come on a journey in the vehicle of, of this body. Or uh, some people say, you know, we are God having a human experience. And if we are God having a human experience, then everything that is happening is happening for some purpose, even if it's a mystery to us in this moment. And finding some way that we can surrender past the fight with our own pain, surrender past this wrestling with why or unfairness, and getting to a place of being able to say, and now how? How will I heal myself? And how will I use what's been given to me to heal and empower myself to reach out and lift other people up? Because service brings us joy. And when you serve other people, you're really doing it for yourself. The stronger your sense of purpose, the better equipped you are to handle challenges and setbacks and recover from them. If you are not clear about why you do what you do, it can lead to unwanted feelings of frustration or aimlessness. Being able to identify this can help you feel that you're leading a more meaningful life. Resilient people know how to ask themselves, what do I want? Let me put that a different way. Here's something Viktor Frankl noticed. His, what they call the second school of psychology, which is existential psychology, he's the founder of it. And his ideas took shape 
in the death camps of Nazi Germany all those years ago. What he noticed in himself and others is that despite the fact that everyone had the same terrible rations of food, there was disease outbreaks all over the place and never enough warm clothing to get through. Despite all that, there were some who would tend to survive and live longer and better than those who didn't. And what he noticed over and again, time and time again, was that those who had a sense of purpose and meaning toward which they were living tended to survive way better. And that is what kicked off his form of psychotherapy, existentialist psychology. So the question that comes from his research that got this whole ball rolling of resilience research is, what is that thing in your life that gives you a sense of purpose and a sense of meaning? That's one exercise I'd like you to engage in this week. And here's the thing. Existentialist psychologists would say that that answer will evolve over time. So if you've answered it one time in your life, it can evolve and change to a really different time in your life. Why, across the street here a couple weeks ago, I have family of a teenager that just th turned 13 put out great effort to make sure that that didn't get jumped over but created this lovely party where people would drive by they would take up a parking place 20 feet away from somebody else their answer to that question of when they have uh, a family with teenagers and it's a really different answer than tomorrow when I go to that little parade of the five-year-old their answer in that question of what gives my life meaning a very different way so to ask, the thing is to ask that question early and often. What gives me purpose? What gives me meaning? And articulate that. The second thing is to find those activities that connect with that thing that gives you purpose and meaning. So maybe take a moment and think, again, what, what is a way, what is a great desire or purpose that you have to reach out and to serve your community? your family or, or the whole world. And for some people, they're more motivated by doing service around the environment. Some people are more motivated um, working you know, at a homeless shelter or a soup kitchen. Some people are more motivated um, working you know, around um, anti-violence. But whatever it is that motivates you, um, finding a way that you can be of service and give back to the rest of the world and to begin to make these positive changes because I do know one thing, pain can be a great motivator. And if you can use the thing that was painful to you to be the rocket fuel for you to create this change in yourself and to bring that kind of healing to the rest of the world, it's, um, it's a really beautiful way to, to live in passion and purpose. Your eye on the horizon and your inner optimism, which says that you will get there, makes your everyday journey worthwhile. You cultivate the never give up attitude because you are driven to achieve something larger than you. Refuel your realistic and long-term optimism and live each day towards the progressive realization of something that's worthwhile.